In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The disciples had a long day. They stayed with Jesus all day, listening to his sermon. The crowd was very big, say 5,000 men, not including women and children. And as the day began to wear away, they came to Jesus and told him the people have to go so they can find something to eat. He told them, feed them. They said, we don't have anything. He told them, look for something. They looked and found five loaves. He told them to make them sit down in an organized fashion. It took them some time. The sun went down. Jesus thanked, blessed, and divided the loaves to give to the people. Then Jesus distributed the loaves. Not not himself, but he gave the loaves to the, to the disciples to distribute to what was something like, say, 15,000 people that they served. The people ate and started to leave afterward. He told the disciples to come back to collect the leftovers. So they went about working once again. So now it's like 8 or 9 at night, and the disciples are collecting leftovers in the dark. And they took up 12 baskets of leftovers. So it must have taken them time to clean up. Now we arrive here at this passage, which is at night. And the text says Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go. He made them. He made them. The weird thing is that this word shows up in three of the Gospels when telling this story. He made them. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. So this story starts off with the disciples not being on the same page with Jesus. They were telling him that they were super happy. Of course, it was a beautiful day. They distributed the loaves with their hands. The miracle was literally on the tips of their fingers. And it was something out of this world that hadn't happened before in history ever. And all the people were happy and proud of the disciples. And they took their fill of food as well as their fill of the word of God. And the disciples gained a lot of respect in the eyes of the people. It's a completely different feeling to go and distribute all these loaves of bread. There were only five loaves in the beginning, so the disciples were feeling this miracle in their hands. Of course, they're excited, of course, and happy, and and they don't want to leave Jesus. But Jesus insisted that they ride the boat without him. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. This part about making them get into the boat will be important to us a little later. So the boat left. The time is now like 10 at night, roughly. So the disciples came to the middle of the sea, and it rises up against them. The wind becomes wild. The sea becomes violent. They can't go back. They can't go forward, and they start to sink. Of course, the disciples, who are fishermen, know how treacherous the sea can be more than just regular people any fisherman has heard stories of other fishermen who have died in the sea and the and the incident didn't take place over half an hour it continued over an hour then two hours then three then four there was no hope and the story continues to get worse and worse not to mention back in those days the boats were not built like like they are today no matter how much they empty out the water from the boat they're still going to sink Of course, what most likely crosses their mind is, where are you, Lord? And probably the first thing that came to the minds of some of them was, well, why didn't he ride the boat with us? Why did he make us ride the boat by ourselves? Take note, this is the whole issue for this trial. It's the first thing that manifests itself in this tribulation. He made them Meaning, he gave them a little push into the sea without riding with them. The other time that this happened, Jesus was aboard the boat and sleeping. So they woke him up. This time is more vexing because Jesus isn't around. So one might think to himself, maybe Jesus wants us to drown. But if he wants us to drown, why did he make us so happy yesterday? How could he lift our morale like that, distributing the loaves? He was able to feed so many people. Can't he make the sea calm down? Doesn't he love us? Why did he make us get into the boat when he knew very well what was going to happen to us? Is he protecting himself? And, 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 and. He doesn't want to drown with us or what? In difficulties, the doubts can play games with your mind and your thoughts. Sometimes people say, 
the night is divided into four watches. That is from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. That's the first watch. From 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. That's the second watch. 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. That's the third watch. And the last watch, the fourth watch, is from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. when the sun rises. So this event takes place in the fourth watch, which means the time is likely like 3 or 4 in the morning. And most likely they've been on the sea since around 10 p.m. So from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., they're dying, drowning. They've used up all their strength. Three times they had to make the rounds with the 15,000 people the day before. The first time they made, them sit, made the people sit down. The second time they distributed the food. The third time they cleaned up. This is a full, days of hard, full day of hard work. They were happy, of course. However, when they boarded the boat, they were intending to sleep. But instead of sleeping, they went five, six hours trying to save the boat, but to no avail. So their strength was drained. Their mental state was exhausted. Jesus isn't appearing. He's not talking. The sea isn't calming down. It looks like we're going to drown. We're going to drown no matter what, straight to our death. All our energy is depleted. And at the very end, before the sun rises, comes Jesus, to whom is the glory, walking on the sea. Here the Bible says, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. Sometimes a person, when he's overexhausted, he thinks he's hallucinating. So when they saw Jesus walking on the water, they lied to themselves. They lied. They said, no, no, that's imaginary. They started screaming. Did they scream out of hope that it was Jesus? Or did they scream out of pure, unadulterated fear? As if the sea wasn't enough. Now we've got ghosts in the picture here. The Bible says they cried out of fear. So do you see the point to which the situation has now reached? They cried out because of the sheer intensity of fear. Fear of the sea, fear of drowning, and even fear of a ghost coming to them, who was actually Jesus. Jesus encouraged them, saying, It is I. Do not be afraid. And it's always at this point, I say to myself, this phrase is so irritating. Why? Is that encouraging? Aren't you going to calm the sea? We've been on the sea for five, six hours drowning. That's enough. When you come, make the sea calm down already. The last time you commanded the elements to be quiet, and immediately the sea became quiet. But to encourage us, you tell us, it is I, do not be afraid. But the situation is staying the same. Nothing's changed. The sea was, the sea was raging. The wind was raging. And they're drowning. And Peter, who was always in a hurry, said to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, Command me to come to you on the water. Most likely Peter here is making a request without really thinking about what he's asking for. Maybe his request originated from his fear, but he didn't think about it. What he's saying is, if you're not going to come to me, then let me come to you. Let one of us come to the other. Of course, he's not paying attention to what he's actually saying. Peter, what are you going to do now? What are you going to walk on the water or what? He said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you. Although Jesus wasn't willing to calm the sea, but when Peter said, let me come to you, Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, still not focused, and starts walking on the water. When he focuses, when he looks at the sea, he gets frightened and starts sinking. So Jesus extends his hand. He he had drawn close to the boat and tells him something weird. He says, oh, you of little faith, meaning Meaning what? Meaning he wasn't supposed to get scared. He was supposed to walk on the water. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Of course, they worshipped him and said, you are the son of God. And right then they knew there was no way that Jesus is not the Lord. Let's consider two points regarding this cross of tribulation. One, the Lord's circumstances with respect to tribulation. And two, my circumstances. What is the Lord doing during tribulation and what am I doing during tribulation? Because if we understand what our Lord is doing, then we'll understand what is requested of us to do, which is important because nobody lives and dies in this world without being tried with tribulations. Tribulations of various shapes and sizes, and we go from tribulation to tribulation, and this story has no end. So we have to understand what God is doing and what we're supposed to do. 
So with this story as an example of, say, a typical tribulation, let's dive in and see what our Lord is doing. First thing, the Lord is the one who is assembling the tribulation. He's the one planning it. Take note of the words. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. He made them, which makes it clear that he's orchestrating the whole thing. If they told Jesus they'll stay, they would mess the whole operation up. So he told them, no, no, you have to take the boat over. Why? Because I've got a surprise for you. A surprise? Oh, yeah, a surprise. There's a surprise, all right. You're going to drown. Tonight, you have to drown. So Jesus is arranging the tribulation. Then the first question that comes to our mind is, has this tribulation come from God or not from God? When tough tribulations hit us, our conscience always doubts. Is God behind all what's happening or not? Or is there someone called our Lord or not? Did he approve this plan? Or did, he not even, or did it not even pass before his eyes? Is he part of that plan? Or am I the cause of it? Or, or the devil? Or, 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 or... And we get lost in all these questions and doubts. No, rest assured, concerning the tribulation... He made them. He's insisting on it. He's planning it. Therefore, the first assertion here is our Lord is the one orchestrating the tribulation. No one else. 